In her private testimony, she says she felt threatened by President Trump. Today, Marie Ivanovich will be able to tell the public why. The former ambassador to Ukraine testifies before the cameras in the impeachment inquiry. The State Department called her home early from her job this spring. According to previous sworn testimony from multiple witnesses, her boss told Yovanovitch she had done nothing wrong, but that the president wanted her gone after a smear campaign that involved the president's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani. On Wednesday, witness George Kent of the State Department spoke of that smear campaign. During the late spring and summer of 2019, I became alarmed as those efforts bore fruit. They led to the ouster of Ambassador Yovanovitch and hampered U.S. efforts to establish rapport with the new Zelensky administration in Ukraine. Okay, so Yovanovitch is going to appear today, and let's talk this through with NPR White House correspondent Franco Odoñez, who is here. Hi there, Franco. Hi, David. Okay, so Yovanovitch, as Steve said, testified in this closed-door testimony that she was was told to basically watch her back. Um, can you just remind us why? Yeah. She pointed to a conversation with a Ukraine official telling her about someone possibly wanting to hurt her. Uh, it was in the context of Rudy Giuliani, Trump's personal attorney, and some of his associates who are trying to push her out of her posts. You know, in fact, she says she's still worried today uh, and that Trump could retaliate. She pointed to Trump's July 25th phone call with a Ukraine leader, with the Ukraine leader, um, when Trump called her, quote, bad news and, quote, she's going to go through some things. Yeah. What, what else has the president said about this and about her? So far, he sought to deflect the criticism. Trump was asked last week if Yovanovitch was the target of a smear campaign. I really don't know her, but if you look at the transcripts, the president of Ukraine was not a fan of hers either. I mean, he did not exactly say glowing things. I'm sure she's a very fine woman. I just don't know much about her. The president was referring to the rough transcript of his, again, July 25th phone call with President Zelensky um, when the, the, the president of Ukraine implied that Yovanovitch favored his own rival. Okay, so now we move into a public setting where this is going to be on the ra on radio, on television. People are going to be watching. What do you expect we'll hear from Yovanovitch this morning? Well, uh, from Yovanovitch, we're going to hear a lot of what she said before. From Republicans, they're going to want to talk about her political opinions. They're likely, as they did before, accuse her of opposing President Trump. They could also press her, as they did before, on which presidential candidates she supported in the Ukraine election this year. You know, some like Jim Jordan, the congressman from Ohio, may press her that it isn't Trump's prerogative to change ambassadors. Or isn't it Trump's prerogative to change ambassadors? This is Jim Jordan, the congressman who actually was brought on to this committee because he's such a staunch defender of the president. Correct. They wanted someone there. Um, OK, so another key witness is scheduled to testify. This is going to be behind closed doors today. What, who is that? David Holmes. He works for the State Department on Ukraine. He's also an aide to William Taylor, the top diplomat in Ukraine. This all relates to Wednesday's big development in the open hearing when Taylor testified that an aide had overheard an interesting conversation. The member of my staff could hear President Trump on the phone asking Ambassador Sondland about the investigations. Ambassador Sondland told President Trump the Ukrainians were ready to move forward. Now, I should say that Trump said he didn't recall the conversation. Next week, we're going to hear from Sondland's side of the story uh, and who is expected to testify on Wednesday. We're also expected to hear from Mark Sandy tomorrow. He's uh, going to talk possibly about the holdup of military aid to Ukraine. He's the first person from the Office of, of Office of Management and Budget to testify. OK, a lot of different parts of this story to follow. NPR White House correspondent Franco Odonia. Thanks, Franco. Thank you. All right, let's turn now to the story of tens of thousands of college students who borrowed money. They allege they were swindled by their schools, which made them eligible to have their loans forgiven. But that didn't happen. At least not yet. But could it change? Late last night, Education Secretary Betsy DeVos apparently responded to pressure from a powerful Democrat. DeVos agreed to turn over Education Department records in this case. She did so just as she was about to be subpoenaed. Congressman Bobby Scott chairs the House Education Committee. We've been asking uh, for information since last year. 
And we expect answers. Well, will the documents provide those answers? A good question to ask NPR correspondent Corey Turner, who's been following the story and joins us. Hey, Corey. Hey, David. Can you start by explaining, take us back, what is this fight all about? Yeah, the fight is all about a federal rule that started in 1995, and it's called borrower defense. And it basically says that if a student is defrauded by a college, they're entitled to have their federal student loans forgiven. But honestly, the, the rule was barely used until just a few years ago in the Obama administration. Okay, so... So what then has changed up to, to, to this point? Well, so that's when several high pro, high profile for profit chains, including Corinthian colleges, were being investigated for lying to students about all sorts of things, including job prospects after graduation and future earnings. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, Current Education Secretary Betsy DeVos has said the rule is too lenient, basically calling it free money. A department spokesperson told NPR the old all-or-nothing strategy was essentially unfair to taxpayers. So what Secretary DeVos did is delayed processing these borrower defense claims. And instead of granting full loan forgiveness, the department also tried to make this new argument that essentially defrauded borrowers who end up earning a decent wage anyway shouldn't necessarily have their loans totally forgiven. Oh, it was based on if, if you really needed to have that money or not. <clears throat> exactly. And and we know that at least as of June, roughly 210,000 borrowers are now waiting for the department to process their claims, many for several years. Um, we don't know how many more claims have come since then, and that's just one of the many things that I know Chairman Bobby Scott hopes to learn from these documents. What what exactly is he looking for in these records? I mean, it seems like DeVos has now avoided a subpoena. They might turn over these records. I mean, what, what might be in there that, that lawmakers are interested in? Well, in addition to more recent data, he also wants emails and internal memos that may explain why the department isn't processing these claims. I spoke with Chairman Scott yesterday, uh, and he said the fact that borrowers have been waiting with this debt for years is really unfair. You can't buy a house, your creditors all messed up. You ought to be relieved of this if you've been defrauded, and that's exactly what's happened in many of these schools. And I should say, David, uh, a committee aide tells NPR that the department said it would provide the documents after Chairman Scott had already signed the subpoena and the department was made aware the subpoena was imminent. What exactly is the Department of Education saying now? Just that they, they turn over these records or are they saying more about how they handled this? Well, this has been a long simmering fight and they insist that this is really much ado about nothing, that they have been transparent with Chairman Scott and the committee, um, that they have granted access to the head of the department's federal student aid office. Uh, a spokesperson told me earlier this week the department's been working really hard to comply with lawful over oversight activities, but that they, meaning Chairman Scott's office, won't take yes for an answer. And Paris Corey Turner. Thanks, Corey. Thank you. All right. Lebanon's prime minister resigned two weeks ago, and now the country might be getting a new leader. Mass protests over corruption and an economic crisis drove Prime Minister Saad Hariri to resign. Now Lebanon's main political parties have agreed on a successor. The possible replacement is a prominent businessman and former minister, exactly the kind of insider that protesters say they do not want. All right, let's turn to NPR international correspondent Daniel Estrin, who is in Beirut. Hi, Daniel. Hi, good morning. Um, What what does it feel like there? I mean, just uh, tell us about these protests and where things stand today. Well, the mood here is really changing, David, because in the first weeks, protesters were really euphoric. There were hundreds of thousands in the streets. It was really a carnival. But then young men from parties opposed to the protests started clashing with protesters. Some even opened fire. In recent days, protesters have continued to block roads. And so the mood is really changing. Uh, We spoke to a couple young men here downtown who said they joined the protests at the beginning, but uh, they're not joining them anymore. They have a very bad feeling about where things are headed. Take a listen to this. Serge Camel. There are militias, uh, there are uh, repercussions, there's, uh, there's a big price to pay to fight corruption head-on in this country, so I'm, I'm not sure what, what a solution would be for that. Uh, the economic situation is already at the rock bottom, like all banks are facing bankruptcy right now. It's scary, and the future is scary. And remember, these protests were sparked by an economic crisis. People were taking money out of the banks. And so now banks are closed. There are limits on how much people can withdraw from ATMs. And uh, this man we just spoke with said he's afraid that Lebanon's reputation around the the world is ruined. Um, He's calling it chaos. And he thinks protesters and the government need to reach a compromise. All right. So we have this new name now um, fitting into this story, this possible replacement for Hariri, as Steve mentioned. Who is it? 
Well, his name is Mohammed Safadi, and all of the main political parties here in Lebanon are supporting him, but he is exactly the kind of guy that protesters don't want. Um, he's 75 years old, a former finance minister. He's one of the richest men in the country. And one example, he's a part owner of a spot in downtown Beirut, not far from where I am right now, that symbolizes a lot of what people are mad about. It's this waterfront area. It used to be a public area where fishermen fished, and then it was turned into private property and a yacht club. And so you have these fancy cafes next to this fancy boardwalk. Um, and, you know, now today people complain that there's only one public beach in all of Beirut. And so people say this is what's happening in this country on a bigger scale. Public resources are being taken over by politicians. They're profiting from them. And uh, protesters are planning a demonstration at that yacht club today. Hmm. I mean, I wonder, like listening to the voice of that protester you talked to, Serge, um, like where do he and other protesters go from here? He sounded frustrated. He sounded worried. Do they keep protest up? Do they accept this this new leader as, as just the way it's going to be? They're not accepting the leader. The protesters say they want to change course, and instead of blocking roads, which is very unpopular with citizens here, they want to uh, target institutions, state institutions. And a big key test here is whether the army will still continue to um, to protect protesters. Um, there were some arrests overnight. One person was killed this week. Uh, we're going to have to see whether there will be more skirmishes or even a crackdown. All right, uh, learning about the situation in Beirut from NPR's international correspondent Daniel Estrin, who is there. Daniel, thanks. Thank you. The situation in Hong Kong is getting worse. Yeah, fiery standoff at one of its major universities culminated with police storming the barricades in the pre-dawn hours. To stop them, protesters who were inside set fire to the barricaded entrances. Now, these demonstrations began almost six months ago over a proposed law that would allow people accused of a crime in Hong Kong to be extradited to mainland China. This law has been withdrawn, but the protests have intensified over concerns that China is tightening its control over the city. And Paris, Julie McCarthy joins us now from Hong Kong. Uh, Julie, thanks for being here this morning. Can you just describe the situation right now? What's happening at the campus? Good morning, Rachel. Well, the campus is, is eerily quiet right now. The protesters continue to hole up and police continue to arrest those trying to escape. The student union president said there's about 600 people, quote, trapped on campus. And the closest we could get today was a road overlooking the campus and a footbridge that burned in the fighting overnight. Polytechnic is, a, is an urban campus. It's full of these big buildings that are linked with footbridges. And the protesters controlled those bridges, stockpiling them like they were garrisons. And from those heights, they were hurling down arrows and gasoline bombs. And the police were pummeling them back with tear gas and water cannon and rubber bullets. It really looked like a war scene. And they warned the protesters to leave or face the consequences as rioters. And you know, know something, Rachel, from those bridges, protesters also controlled the Cross Harbor Tunnel all last week. It links Hong Kong Island to the rest of the territory. This was no ordinary protest. Hmm. And the dramatic events on that campus mark a powerful turn in the violence for these anti-government protests. Right. It's crazy to think about arrows. Um, mm. So this is the start of a work week. Well, mm. I mean, how are the protests going to affect the city? Well, the, you know, the university siege ignited these hot spots around the school. That was the epicenter of disruption today. Reinforcements arrived this morning in the form of mainstream supporters, but they also clashed with police in some of these really heavily trafficked parts of Hong Kong near the school. One 29-year-old woman skipped work today to help the protesters. She identifies herself as Alice to avoid reprisals at work, and I asked her why she was out there. Democracy and freedom to me. Many of us, like we have no gears, we don't even have the mask on my face. And then many of the people like us were arrested. But this is nonsense. It's all about our rights and freedoms are suppressed by the government and also by Beijing. Hmm. So speaking of Beijing, I mean, what's the word from mainland China? Well, the foreign ministry said no one should underestimate China's will to safeguard its sovereignty and Hong Kong's stability. But, you know, there was another signal this weekend that a lot of people interpreted as a warning. For the first time since the protests began, the Chinese People's Liberation Army left their barracks in Hong Kong 
And they were out volunteering, quote unquote, to clear the debris from the protesters that had that they left behind in their blockades. It was symbolic and it was provocative. And for months, Hong Kong residents have worried about the PLA soldiers deployed on the streets to crack down. A reminder here for many of the PLA entering Tiananmen Square. Right. NPR's Julie McCarthy in Hong Kong. Thank you. Thank you. All right, David, we're going into week two of public impeachment hearings, and Democrats get another chance to try and draw a direct line between President Trump and a plan to tie Ukrainian aid to investigations of Democrats. Yes, so here we go into week two, and in week two, eight people are expected to testify for the House Intelligence Committee. President Trump has already raised accusations of witness intimidation for attacking former Ambassador Marie Ivanovich on Twitter. He also maligned Jennifer Williams, an aide to Vice President Mike Pence. This is how speak, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi responded to all that, speaking to CBS on Sunday. The words of the president weigh a ton. They are very significant, and uh, he should not frivolously throw out insults. But that's what he does. NPR's Claudia Grisales joins us now. Good morning, Claudia. Hi, Rachel. Okay, so uh, the big news over the weekend, there were all these kind of developments, uh, but two two transcripts were released that were notable, right? Yes, we got the transcripts of two closed door uh, testimonies, and these are for witnesses who are set to testify this week. Tim Morrison, the former deputy assistant to the president and top Russia advisor at the National Security Council, as well as Jennifer Williams. She's a special advisor to the vice president on Europe and Russia. And according to the transcript, Morrison called this July 25th discussion between the president and Ukraine's leader, quote, unusual, and said he was concerned that its contents would leak. But he also did not think the president did anything illegal. Williams, on the other hand, said she found the call both, quote, unusual and inappropriate. Trump fired back on Sunday on Twitter. He said, quote, tell Jennifer Williams, whoever that is, to read both transcripts of the presidential calls and see the just released statement from Ukraine. Then she should meet with the other never Trumpers who I don't know and mostly never even heard of and work out a better presidential attack. So this is the president of the United States attacking an aide who works for his own vice president. I mean, has Pence's office defended her? Not directly. When asked for a comment to the president's tweet, the vice president's press secretary, Katie Waldman, told CNN, quote, Jennifer is a State Department employee. Hmm, because she she officially works for the State Department, but she has uh, been seconded to work for the vice president Correct. on his national security team. All right. So now week two, public testimony. Uh, what's coming up? So Morrison and Williams are expected to testify in an open hearing on a very busy day tomorrow alongside former special envoy to Ukraine, Kurt Volker, as well as Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman, who serves on the National Security Council. On Wednesday, that's another high-profile day because we will see Sondland, a central figure in this saga, alongside a Pentagon official, Laura Cooper, and State Department Undersecretary David Hale. Finally, on Thursday, Fiona Hill, the former top Russia advisor on the National Security Council, will come before the House Intelligence Committee. So just remind us of all those names. It's really Gordon Sondland, the ambassador to the EU, that's going to be incredibly important, right? Correct. He's the former Trump donor turned ambassador to the EU who became a key player in these talks with Ukraine when U.S. military aid stalled out. He testified initially he wasn't aware of the demands for an investigation in exchange for the aid, but later revised that testimony on the heels of other witnesses reporting he was intimately involved in this plan. All right. NPR's Claudia Grisales uh, looking out for all the public testimony in the impeachment inquiry this week. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. All right. So back in May, the U.S. government added the Chinese tech giant Huawei to this economic blacklist, citing national security concerns. Right. And so this meant that American companies could not do business with Huawei unless those firms had a special license. The thing is, a licensing agreement expires today and the Trump administration is expected to grant an extension to renew it. So is Huawei getting a break here? We've got NPR tech correspondent Shannon Bond with us this morning. Hi, Shannon. Rachel. All right. So just remind us how Huawei got in the crosshairs of the U.S. government in the first place. 
Right. Huawei is one of the biggest, the world's biggest makers of smartphones and telecoms equipment, and it relies on a lot of American companies to supply things like processing chips, and in the case of its phones, Google's Android software. The administration says it's worried, though, that Huawei and other big Chinese companies could be spying for Beijing or stealing intellectual property. Huawei maintains that the U.S. has given no evidence of spying, but back in May, the Trump administration put Huawei on something called the entity list. So that means U.S. companies can't sell products without government approval. The real story here is the trade war going on between the U.S. and China. And Huawei is really being used for leverage. Back in June, when President Trump met, met with Chinese President Xi, they agreed to a ceasefire while they, in the trade war while they continued negotiations. And at that same meeting, Trump said that some U.S. companies would be able to do business with Huawei while those talks continued. So it's right in the middle of all of this. And so why would the Trump administration grant this extension? Well, when the government put Huawei on this blacklist, it also granted them granted a tra- temporary license that would let U.S. companies keep doing some work for a limited period of time to minimize disruption to their businesses. So that means companies could provide software updates to Huawei phones. And it, it was particularly aimed at some smaller rural cell phone and Internet providers in the U.S. that rely on Huawei for their networking equipment. Here's Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross on Friday speaking with Fox Business. There are enough problems with telephone service in the rural communities. We don't want to knock them out. So one of the main purposes of the temporary general licenses is to let those rural guys continue to operate. So, I mean, this this is aimed at those smaller those smaller uh, organizations, those smaller companies. But writ large, how's how's this playing out for for all U.S. companies that do business with Huawei? Well, you know, the, the rep- this reprieve has been extended twice already. You know, as we said, it expires at the end of the day. Um, other publications are reporting it will be extended for a third time, though NPR hasn't confirmed this. But those extensions really are temporary, right? And U.S. companies say what they want to understand is how they'll be able to deal with Huawei going forward. Hmm. The Trump administration says it's also working towards allowing some businesses to be able to sell to Huawei if it's not for nas- sensitive national security areas. Huawei says there are 200 companies, uh, chip makers and others, that want to sell them things and 40,000 jobs in the U.S. that could depend on those deals. Um, In the meantime, Huawei has made great strides in finding alternatives to U.S. chips, even creating its own mobile operating system. So this fight with Huawei, in many ways, may be creating a stronger and more independent tech company in China. Hmm. All right. NPR's uh, technology correspondent Shannon Bond talking with us this morning. Uh, Thanks, Shannon. We appreciate it. Thanks, Rachel. So how do Americans feel about the idea of an impeachment? I think the impeachment thing is a total fraud. The swamp in uh, D.C., they're just kidding themselves. My opinion of the current administration is so bad that I just can't stomach it. Everyone's playing politics with the issue as opposed to it's at a point now where I don't know what what the actual law is. Some voices that we heard from around the country as four more witnesses get ready to testify in public today. Three of those witnesses were actually listening in on that July 25th phone call between President Trump and Ukraine's leader. That phone call is at the heart of the impeachment inquiry. And whatever they think about the process, Americans are paying close attention. Right. That's according to a new NPR PBS NewsHour Maris poll that came out today. And let's talk about it with NPR White House reporter Aisha Roscoe. Hi, Aisha. Hello. All right. So new poll. What numbers are standing out here? Uh, So Americans are paying attention. So some 70 percent of registered voters say they're following news about impeachment very or fairly closely. But the country remains fairly evenly split about impeachment. And a large majority say nothing will change uh, their mind at this point. Uh, On the question of whether Trump should be impeached and removed from office, 45 percent are in favor, 44 are against. Uh, Two thirds of people say they don't think anything will come out that will sway their position. Uh, That said, this poll was done last week, Monday through Friday, so it captures the time before, during, and after those hearings last week, and there's still time for that public testimony to sink in. Sure, but I mean, it sounds like there's agreement on that a lot of people are paying attention. There's agreement on a lot of people are not going to change their minds. Is there common ground anywhere when it comes to the substance of, of what we're hearing? 
Well, th there is broad agreement. Uh, Seventy percent of people say that it's unacceptable for the president to ask a foreign leader to investigate a political opponent. So people clearly believe that President Trump did something wrong. But the question is whether he should be impeached and removed over it. All right. Well, speaking about how this is playing out, House investigators release two more transcripts now from closed door testimony, including um, testimony from this U.S. diplomat, David Holmes. What, what did he have to say? And remind us who he is. So Holmes uh, works at the U.S. Embassy in Kiev. In, in July, he overheard part of this phone conversation between Trump and Gordon Sondland, uh, the U.S. ambassador to the EU. And Trump uh, asked on that phone call, Trump asked if the Ukrainian President Zelensky would do the investigation. And Sondland said that he would. Uh, Holmes uh, asked Sondland after that call whether Trump cared about Ukraine. And Holmes said that uh, Sondland told him that Trump did not care, that he cared only about the, quote, big stuff like the Biden investigation. Uh, the language that was used on that call is a bit more colorful uh, than I can use on uh, radio okay. right now. <laughs> um, but that that was the gist of it. Uh, and, and Sondland is scheduled to testify uh, this week. So having this testimony out from Holmes uh, is going to ba basically play a, a big part in that uh, hearing uh, later this week with Sondland. To shape some of the questioning for him. Um, what, what about today? Preview what we're going to see today. So two of the witnesses today were requested by Republicans, uh, Kurt Volker, the former special envoy for Ukraine, and Timothy Morrison, director of European, who was director of European affairs for NSC. And, and why the, the Republicans uh, wanted Volker is because uh, Volker uh, had pre testified previously that he believed that the holdup of aid for Ukraine was not significant. Uh, Tim Morrison was on that call uh, between Trump and Ukraine's president, but he didn't say he said he didn't think that anything happened that was illegal. Um, and so that's why the Republicans are probably looking for them. Also testifying today are Jennifer Williams, an aide to Vice President Pence, and Alexander Vindman, a top White House expert on Ukraine. All right. And Pierce Ayesha Rasko. Ayesha, thanks a lot. We appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Let's hear more about one of the witnesses Ayesha mentioned there. It's Army Lieutenant Colonel Vindman. Yeah. As as a top Ukraine expert on the National Security Council, Vindman was listening when President Trump spoke with Ukraine's president in that July 25th phone call. Television viewers are likely to see Vindman turn up in his dark blue Army service uniform. Behind the optics, though, Vindman brings a really compelling backstory. Yeah, and let's uh, talk about what we might hear from him. NPR National Security Correspondent Greg Myrie is here. Hey there, Greg. Hey, David. Okay, so talk. Uh, give us some of the background of Vindman. I mean, how did he make his way to this, this job inside the White House? <laughs> well, he started in Ukraine. That's where he was born huh. in the 1970s when it was still part of the Soviet Union. And he's got an identical twin, Yevgeny. Uh, their mother died when they were very young. The father brought them to the, the U.S., to New York, um, up the place, little... Uh, excuse me, Brighton Beach, also known as Little Odessa because of all the Russian and Ukrainian immigrants. And it turns out the Vindman twins were in a 1985 Ken Burns documentary. Um, so let's have a little bit of a listen to that here. We came, came from, from, Russia. from Kiev. And then we went to... Our mother died, so we went to Italy. And then we came here. So sweet. <laughs> so now these are both lieutenant colonels in the Army. Both of them actually serve on, on the National Security Council. Um, and Vindman, Alexander Vindman, <clears throat> who's testifying today, uh, be, is an, an East European expert uh, and, and has been serving in that capacity. Wow, with so much history with, with Ukraine. So, okay, on that July 25th phone call, Vindman was at the White House, actually in the Situation Room, listening in to... President Trump's call. What, what what do we know so far of what he made of that call? Well, he was upset immediately um, and because he gave testimony, closed door testimony back on October 29. And in that testimony, he said, I did not think it was proper to demand that a foreign government, Ukraine, uh, investigate a U.S. citizen. And immediately he took those concerns and uh, he went to the, the legal counsel at the National Security uh, at, at the NSC. So he raised that almost immediately. So it sounds like his testimony could be 
I mean, important. I mean, all the testimony you can argue is important for, for one way or another or, or, or not. But I mean, w- what makes this stand out? Well, uh, we're going to be hearing from people this week who are in on the call. And in Vindman's case, he, he noted, and again, in his previous testimony that he, in the spring, he was seeing what he called outside influencers promoting a false narrative. So he was sort of on to this or early on or had concerns. There was a July 10th meeting, two weeks before the phone call. He also raised that with the NSC legal counsel. So he corroborates the whistleblower. And even before this July 25th phone call, he was raising concerns. And as you cover this, I mean, what are you looking for as this week goes on? Well, we've got nine people testifying uh, this week. Uh, Gordon Sondland, the ambassador uh, to the European Union, uh, is is coming up tomorrow. And he was uh, on the uh, the phone call on July 26th, this loud phone call from a restaurant in Kiev. So I think that's going to be one of the one of the important uh, witnesses this week. And Paris Greg Myrie in our studios here in Washington. Greg, thanks a lot. Thank you. Right. Iran is warning of a clampdown on mass protests that erupted after the regime hiked gasoline prices. Right. And details of this are sketchy because the government in Iran has shut down the Internet. Last week, the government hiked gas prices by 50 percent. Protesters turned out and things got violent over the weekend. Several people are reported to have been killed. The country's supreme leader has condemned all the unrest, which has reportedly spread to about 100 cities. In a tweet, the U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo expressed solidarity with the people of Iran. And here's what U.S. Ambassador to the United Arab Emirates, John Rocolta, said on Sunday. We're not advocating regime change. We're going to let the Iranian people decide for themselves their future. But their future is to be part of the world community. Quite a moment in Iran. Let's talk it through with NPR international correspondent Peter Kenyon, who's in Istanbul. Hi, Peter. Hi, David. So a hundred cities, some of the reports suggesting these protests have uh, have erupted. Mm-hmm. I mean, this sounds widespread and and pretty intense. Yeah, the intensity seems to ebb and flow. I mean, today the government's talking about calm being restored. Uh, we'll see if that lasts. Uh, these protests started Friday, mostly peacefully. But since then, uh, lots and lots of cities, Karman Shah, Shiraz, Boucher, Isfahan, parts of Tehran. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to go through 100 cities. Sure, thank but you. A lot of rioting all over the country. Uh, in some cases, gas stations are big targets or ATMs, emphasizing the anger at this 50% hike in the fuel costs. Uh, and that also, by the way, includes a rationing system. So any driver that goes over the limit of about 15 gallons a month has to pay like triple the normal cost. Uh, so by Western standards, we should note even these increased prices are quite low. Uh, but in the context of the Iranian economy, it's painful, especially for low income people. OK, so a lot of people angry. These protests erupt. Um, the government, as Rachel said, has shut down the Internet. What else are they doing in response to this? Well, there's been direct clashes between police and security forces and protesters, and the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps has warned that an even more decisive reaction could come if these protests continue. Uh, As you mentioned, Iran Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei has come out. He's cautiously supporting the fuel price increase. He's calling the protesters thugs, which seemed to put a bit of a chill on the numbers turning out. Uh, But that's based on sketchier evidence, because with the Internet cut, it's, it's harder to get the information now. I have to ask about any U.S. role here. I mean, U.S. sanctions are meant to put pressure on Iran's economy. Are are they related to this? Iran's foreign minister says so. Mohammad Javad Zarif uh, responded to a comment by Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, who tweeted the U.S. was with the people of Iran. Uh, Zarif said any American regime that imposes coercive economic sanctions, bars food and drugs, etc., is not supporting the Iranian nation. Washington says it's not targeting food and medicine, but banks are reluctant to do a lot of these transactions, and it's possible more sanctions are on the way. And as you look at the economic conditions in the country right now, overall, I mean, what what is life like there? It was a brief respite of better times after the 2015 nuclear deal started. But since these sanctions came in last year, the American sanctions, the real is down. People's savings are beaten, being eaten up. Unemployment is way up. And Europe, which has tried to solve the problem with increased trade, has really had pretty limited success so far. And Pierre's Peter Kenyon in Istanbul. Peter, thanks so much. Thank you, David.
He has changed his story once before, and today he is back to testify as a star witness in the public impeachment inquiry. Yeah, that's right. Last month, Gordon Sondland, the U.S. ambassador to the European Union, testified behind closed doors. And he said there was not a quid pro quo involved with getting military aid to Ukraine. A few days went by, and then he submitted an addendum to his testimony. He said that delivery of the aid was actually contingent on these investigations that President Trump wanted. Yesterday, Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman testified publicly. He's the White House's top expert on Ukraine. And here's what he said about Sondland. Ambassador Sondland said that in order to get a White House meeting, the Ukrainians would have to provide a deliverable, which is investigations, specific investigations. So should Republicans be worried about what Sondland says today? NPR congressional correspondent Susan Davis is here in the studio. Hi, Sue. Good morning, Rachel. So there are a lot of expectations around Gordon Sondland's testimony today. Noel alluded to some of it. I mean, he changed story. Explain why he has become such a critical witness. Sondland is a bit of a wild card. I don't believe either Democrats or Republicans are truly confident in what he's going to testify to today. As you noted, he is the only witness so far to change his testimony. He initially told Congress when he testified behind closed doors that no conditions had ever been placed on the aid. Following other public testimonies, he said his memory had been jogged and that he did, in fact, on September 1, tell a top aide to President Ukrainian President Zelensky that getting that aid was contingent on investigation. Of course, the aid was ultimately released without the investigations being launched two days after Congress was notified about that whistleblower complaint. Right. So since since Sondland's original testimony, since his addendum, we have learned about yet another conversation that he had with President Trump. This happened on a phone call when Sondland was in this restaurant in Kiev, right? A critical detail that was revealed in other testimony, uh, the testimony of Bill Taylor, who's a top diplomatic official in Ukraine. He said a top aide of his, David Holmes, who later came and testified to Congress that on July 26th, the day after the July 25th phone call, he was at a restaurant with Gordon Sondland and the president called or Sondland called the president and Mm -hmm. Holmes could hear the president on the phone. Uh, Sondland held the phone out because the president was talking so loud and he could hear the president asking directly about investigations. After he got off the call, Holmes testified that Sondland told him uh, in colorful language that the president did not care about Ukraine and that he only cared about in what he called the big stuff, which he said was things like the Biden investigation. And we heard Sondland's name broached a few different times in yesterday's testimony from a few different people. Um, I want to ask in particular about the witnesses that the Republicans called, though, yesterday. They wanted to talk with former special envoy to Ukraine, Kurt Volker, and Tim Morrison, a former top national security official. Did these two witnesses help Republicans make their case? They certainly gave Republicans uh, talking points in their lines of defense. Both men sort of had a very different take on the the circumstances around the July 25th phone call and the military aid. Volcker presented himself as sort of a guy out of the loop. He wasn't inside the room for a lot of these decisions, and he just wasn't aware of the lot of the of the machinations at play. Uh, Morrison, who was uh, one of the officials on the July 25th phone call, said, "We should just say, sorry, the, July 25th. This is the phone call between yes, Trump and President the original Zelensky. phone call." He didn't hear anything that raised a red flag. Uh, However, Volcker did also uh, sort of undermine one of the Republican talking points against Joe Biden. I've known uh, Vice President, former Vice President Biden for a long time. I know how he respects uh, uh, his duties of higher office. And it's just not uh, credible to me that uh, a vice president of the United States is going to do anything other than act as how he sees best for the national interest. And that certainly didn't help the Republican argument that this corruption that was worthy of investigation on its merits alone. All right. Well, we'll be watching what happens today in that testimony. NPR's Susan Davis. Thank you, Sue. You're welcome. So if you are tuning into the impeachment hearings, and a lot of you are, maybe you've noticed. Now, with all due respect, Ambassador, your clear understanding was obviously wrong. This whole thing is a sad, sad episode for the country. Your boss had concerns about your judgment. Your former boss, Dr. Hill, had concerns about your judgment. Your colleagues had concerns about this your judgment. This is scary what these guys are putting our country through. It is, it, is, it is sad. It is scary. It is wrong. 
Strong words, a combative tone seem to flare up whenever a powerful Ohio Republican has the microphone. That Republican is Congressman Jim Jordan. Now, interestingly, he's not a permanent member of the House Intelligence Committee, but he was reassigned there for the impeachment inquiry because he's one of President Trump's fiercest defenders and Jordan knows how to go on the attack. Reporter Nick Evans is at member station WOSU in Columbus, Ohio. He's been doing a little digging into Congressman Jordan and he joins us now. Hi, Nick. Hey, how are you guys? Doing well. So first, just explain how it came to be that Jim Jordan is is now suddenly on the House Intelligence Committee. Well, it's like you said, he was a late addition. He came in about maybe two weeks ago and uh, forced a, a guy from Arizona. Forced a guy from Arkansas named Rick Crawford to uh, take a seat for a while. Hmm. Um, so and they can Jim do Jordan, that. That's okay with the rules of the committee. You can just like replace yes. people. Huh. Yeah, absolutely. So Jim Jordan is on the committee right now to basically be the sort of the attack dog for the Republicans on the committee to sort of f- push this uh, to sort to sort of. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. He's he's there to 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 go on the attack. He, he President Basically, Trump yeah. knows that he's one of his closest allies, right? Yeah, and he uh, he is seen as one of the fiercest defenders. And, and what's more, he he has been one of the most he's been one of the most willing to go on the offensive in terms of the 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 substance of, of the the impeachment inquiry. Right. He, he's not been the one um, arguing about process. Uh-huh. He's been saying, you know, there there's no there there um, from from the early going. What else should we know about him? Well, he's been in the House since uh, 2007. He helped establish the Freedom Caucus, and this was a just a thorn in the GOP leadership side when. Republicans had control of the House. He he sort of sees himself in the caucus, I think, as uh, speaking truth to power, uh, trying to force Republicans to um, do what they say they are going to do. Now, that has um, not exactly endeared him to leadership with uh, John Boehner, another Ohio uh, Republican, uh, or Paul Ryan. Um, and, and so he has been just this aggressive force ever since he's gotten there. And the thing that everybody brings up about him is his time as a wrestler. In high school, he was a a four-time state champ. In college, he was a two-time national champ. Um, He he was a really, really talented guy. And I think that that is seen as something that really informs how he interacts with people. Although we should just note briefly that he has, uh, there's been a controversy surrounding Jim Jordan about his tenure um, in collegiate wrestling allegations that he turned a blind eye to some uh, sexual uh, misbehavior uh, allegations against others, right? Right, right. So after he, um, after he graduated, he became an assistant coach. Um, he, he, okay. um, he was assistant right. coach at Ohio State, and uh, according to some people who were there, they believe that he knew about okay. a doctor who had been molesting um, students there. All right. Reporter Nick Evans with our member station in Columbus. Thank you. Anytime. A Hong Kong citizen who worked for the British consulate says Chinese secret police tortured him earlier this year, accusing him of being a spy for the UK. This man's name is Simon Chang, and he told the BBC that he was detained, blindfolded and beaten while he was visiting mainland China. Now, the British government says it's outraged and it has summoned China's ambassador to the UK to answer questions about what went on. All right. For more, we've we've got NPR's London correspondent Frank Langfitt with us. Frank, remind us of the background to this case. Yeah, well, this guy, Simon uh, Chung, he's a Hong Kong citizen, and he was visiting the mainland, actually, and was detained by police there, and he was accused of soliciting prostitution, disappeared into the murky detention system that we're familiar with, and was eventually released. Now, he's just gone public uh, in an interview with the BBC and writing extensively on Facebook, saying they tortured him, the Chinese police did, and tried to get him to implicate the UK in helping to incite violent protests in Hong Kong. And of course, this is the Chinese Communist Party narrative, that shadowy foreign forces are driving the protests, not because of 
democracy, but actually just to weaken China. Huh. Um, and, and what specifically is Qing uh, accusing the it's, Chinese? It's really person? detailed. Uh, what he has to say, particularly on Facebook, he said that he was blindfolded, hooded and shackled, taken to a remote site. He was forced to squat and stand for hours without any sleep. If he moved or he didn't do this, he would either be beaten with batons or forced as punishment to sing China's national anthem. Uh, he said that they wanted him to confess to trying to incite protests. He does admit that he did support the protests, that he attended rallies, but he says absolutely not. A, he's not a spy. So if what he's saying is true, uh, what? how does that affect what we're seeing right now, the standoff you know, between the government? I think what's really interesting to me about this, Rachel, is this kind of treatment, if true, is exactly the greatest fear of the Hong Kong protesters. It's what triggered the protests initially. Remember, there was this extradition uh, treaty where uh, people from Hong Kong could be taken to the mainland uh, based on other charges. And the fear is that uh, this would erode the freedoms that Hong Kong enjoys under the one country, two systems uh, system that went into place in 1997. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the idea you know, that, that this guy could be take, caught in the mainland and punished for something he did in Kong, Hong Kong almost makes the protesters' points for them. And and this guy worked for the British government. He what did. kind of effect is this going to have on London's relationship with well, Beijing? Well, relationships are already, was already pretty bad. What the, what the British have said is they're outraged by this and they want the UK, uh, the Chinese ambassador to the UK to come and speak to the foreign ministry. China is saying, forget it. You guys need to come apologize to us uh, because uh, you're trying to undermine China. Um, so that gives you also a sense of how much power British ha the British have in this relationship with a much, much larger economy. All right. NPR's Frank Langfoot reporting from London. Thanks, Frank. We appreciate it. You're very welcome, Rachel. There was one thing a key witness said yesterday that is sure to hang over this morning's impeachment hearings. I know that members of this committee frequently frame these complicated issues in the form of a simple question. Was there a quid pro quo? As I testified previously, with regard to the requested White House call and the White House meeting, the answer is yes. That dramatic testimony came from Gordon Sondland. He's the ambassador to the EU who talked about Ukraine directly with President Trump and with Trump's personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani. And yesterday, Democrats called Sondland's public testimony a, quote, seminal moment in their case for impeachment. So why were Republicans claiming complete exoneration by the end of the day? And what more might we learn from today's witnesses? We have White House correspondent Franco Ordonez with us here. Hey, Franco. Hi, David. OK, so when this hearing began, Ambassador Sondland, it sounded like he was implicating this long list of people in what he was describing as a quid pro quo. I mean, what? Who was he saying was in the loop here? Uh, according to him, everyone that mattered, the president, vice president, secretary of state Mike Pompeo, other officials, he repeated it. Everyone was in the loop. He said, a key, he said to get a White House meeting, Ukraine's president needed to announce an investigation into a political rival and interference in the 2016 election. I should note that Pence and Pompeo have denied this from their staff, but Sunland also complained that the White House and State Department wouldn't give him access to documents and records about his own activities on Ukraine. So, I mean, as, as he is saying this stuff, how are Republicans in this hearing room responding? Not well. They complained about early reports um, of Sunland's testimony. For example, Matt Drudge, the influential conservative website who wrote the Drudge Report, he had headlines like, Sunland dropped bombs and Pence knew. Ken Starr, who investigated the Clinton administration, was on Fox News saying he thought some Republican senators may even push Trump to resign. So that's earlier on in the day. But by the, the end of the day, Republicans and also the White House were claiming a victory. I mean, why is that and what, what transpired? Well, that's because during questions, Sunland made two things clear. He said he didn't know why the military aid was held up. He just presumed it was connected to the demand for investigations. Congressman, I was presuming. I also said that President Trump. So no one told you, not just the president. Giuliani didn't tell you. Mulvaney didn't tell you. Nobody. Pompeo didn't tell you. Nobody else on this planet told you that Donald Trump was tying aid to these investigations. Is that correct? 
That was Republican Congressman Mike Turner from Ohio, one of several lawmakers who pressed Sunland on that point. The second thing is Sunland recounted a conversation that he had with the president on September 9th, where he said there was no quid pro quo. After he, after Sunland reported that, uh, President Trump came out of the White House and he was dramatically recounting this phone conversation, repeating, I want nothing, I want nothing. And he was saying that over and again. And over and over again. It is worth noting that on September 9th, it is possible that the president knew about the whistleblower complaint because it was reported a week earlier. In fact, that same day, the inspector general notified the House Intelligence Committee of the complaint, calling it an urgent concern. Oh, I see. So possibly some important timing there. Um, All right. So impeachment hearings resume today. What's happening? Well, David Holmes is going to testify. He works at the U.S. Embassy in Kiev. He's going to talk about overhearing Sunland talk on a cell phone about investigations, quote, investigations. And Fiona Hill, she is a Russia expert at the National Security Council. She's going to talk about the Gordon problem. And Pierre White House correspondent Franco Ordonez. Thanks, Franco. Thank you. All right, so impeachment was the first topic in last night's Democratic presidential debate, but Senator Elizabeth Warren used it to try and pivot to a more populist message. Yeah, here she is making her point by criticizing Trump mega donor Gordon Sondland, who later became ambassador to the EU. How did Ambassador Sutherland get there? You know, this is not a man who had any qualifications except one. He wrote a check for a million dollars. And that tells us about what's happening in Washington. From there, the candidates took on health care, foreign policy, how to mobilize voters, but they didn't really take on each other. And NPR national political correspondent Mara Lyason was covering all this. Morning, Mara. Hi, David. So looking at going into this debate, I mean, Pete Buttigieg, the, the South Bend, Indiana mayor, has really been on the rise, leading polls in Iowa. It's looking like he's doing better in New Hampshire right now. That usually is a sign that he's going to get attacked um, on a debate stage. It's, did that happen? It happened, but it was pretty mild. Um, Only Amy Klobuchar, a fellow Midwesterner, made some mild criticism of Buttigieg, saying there was a double standard. If a woman had been the mayor of the fourth largest city in Indiana, Indiana, she wouldn't be considered to have the experience for president. Hmm. Pete Buttigieg, who's another nice Midwesterner, came back saying experience in Washington isn't the only kind of experience. So if the other candidates were trying to stop Mayor Pete's rise, you really couldn't tell last night. It's possible they don't think his rise is sustainable or that it's just too risky or too too early in a multi-candidate race to be too aggressive against each other. Well, there, there was one confrontation on policy last night over the economy. Senator Cory Booker challenged Elizabeth Warren, criticizing uh, her wealth tax and, and her focus on e- e- income redistribution. Let's listen. But the people and communities I frequent, they're not aspiration for their lives is not just to have those fair wages. They want to have an economy that provides not just equalities in wealth, but they want to have equalities opportunity. And that's what our party has to be about as well. I mean, a question about what the party is about. What did this moment represent something in your mind? Well, it represents a substantive debate that's gone on in the Democratic Party for decades, redistribution or growth. Do you distribute the pie or try to grow it first? And what you've got is someone in the top tier, Elizabeth Warren, who has a kind of tax the rich plan to pay for her many programs, and then someone, Cory Booker, struggling to stay on the stage. He hasn't qualified for the December debate yet. And he's presenting the message that it's necessary to grow wealth first before you spread it, and that my Minority communities don't just want a higher minimum wage. They want the chance to own businesses. And that really echoed a warning from former President Barack Obama, who is warning Democrats don't go too far to the left to win a general election. Most Americans want to reform the system and improve it, but not tear it up from the roots. So as the race leaves this debate stage in Atlanta, where step back for us if you can. Where do, where do you stand right now? Well, I don't think the debate did anything to disrupt the current dynamic in the race. Buttigieg is surging. Warren's rise may have come to an end. Biden is still the national leader, and no one has yet challenged him with African-American voters, including the three African-American candidates. There was a recent Quinnipiac poll that showed Mayor Pete with zero, zero percent support among Mm -hmm. African-Americans in South Carolina. So it shows us that the race is still very unsettled. NPR's Mara Eliason. Thanks as always, Mara. Thank you. Hateful, 
graffiti on campus, racist slurs shouted at students, reports about the sharing of a white supremacist manifesto. Yeah, this is all happening at Syracuse University. The community there is grappling with the aftermath of about a dozen racist incidents. For days, students have been staging the sit-in, and now the FBI is investigating the reported racist messages and crimes. The chancellor there held a forum last night to speak with students, but that quickly devolved and students walked out. Students wanted the chancellor to sign a list of demands and protesters gathered outside his house. To disagree with signing a document that was compiled for him in the interest of students of color is inadequate. He needs to resign. And I want to turn to Casey Darnell, a student at Syracuse and the news editor at the Daily Orange, the campus newspaper. Casey, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. So what led to this moment? What, what are these racist incidents we're talking about? Um, exactly two weeks ago, students found uh, racist graffiti against Black and Asian people in a dorm building. Um, it took the university four days to notify the campus about that. Ever since then, there's been more reports of racist graffiti. Um, there were two swastikas found, one in the snow off campus, one written in a dorm building. Um, on Saturday, uh, members, of, members of a fraternity and their guests um, yelled a racial slur at a black woman. And just um, on Tuesday, um, early in the morning, around um, 2 a.m., um, there were reports of a um, white supremacist manifesto um, from the uh, shooter in the Christchurch massacre in New Zealand um, being shared on campus. Um, and ever since then, there's just been more and more reports coming out. And, and I mean, we, it didn't sound like students feel like they're getting the response they want from the university. What, what do they want that they're not getting right now? Overall, they want the university to actually care about their safety. Um, they've been calling for mandatory diversity training among faculty and staff. They want stricter consequences for hate speech, and they want diversity and inclusion to be more than just buzzwords. And you, so this forum last night, what, what did it feel like in that room? How tense was it? It really gave me chills to see all hundreds of students walk in in all black, um, and they um, the chancellor spoke, and then there was a brief questioning, um, and then they were unsatisfied with his refusal to immediately address their demands. They all stood up, put their jackets on at once, and walked out, and a uh, chance of sign or resign, telling him to sign the demands or <laughs> leave, um, filled the chapel. Um, it was a really powerful moment. Um, and I think everyone was just shocked. Wow. I mean, what, what is it like being a, a student right now in this climate? It's, it's exhausting and it's emotionally draining. Um, a lot of my friends are afraid to leave their homes, afraid to go to classes. Um, it's really eerie to kind of go to campus at 7 a.m. to cover the sit-in. And there's just no one around. There's not a single person walking across the main campus space except for campus police patrolling. Wow. All right. So this really has affected life there. Um, Casey Darnell is a student at Syracuse University, the news editor as well of the Daily Orange newspaper, the campus newspaper. Casey, thank you very much. 